Hello everyone, George here and we're back again with the Warsaw project that I've been working on for the last several weeks. In this particular case, what I'm doing now is beginning to work on the walls. Uh, at the time of putting this together, I had a delivery date of uh, basically one week from when I was actually recording this particular episode. So I realized that yes, we've got plenty of assets, but I really need to actually start putting the, the room together. And you can see I have a, t a template wall piece right there. But now what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to lay things out. And I make a major change from how I normally do things. If you've watched any of my other series, then you notice that I work a lot in Maya and then export those assets out to Substance Painter, not Substance Painter, um, to Unity uh, as kind of a whole object, and then I work within that space. However, for this project, I don't know how long I'm going to be the key person working on it. I might hand this off to a student at some point, or a team of students, more likely. And I need everything to be modular and in a system that they can understand. And since I'm the only one who works in Maya, it doesn't make sense for me to burden the entire project by making it kind of encapsulated within Maya. So instead, what I'm going to do now is create all the assets so that they're completely reusable inside of Unity and that everything gets put together inside of Unity, the entire level layout. And this makes a lot more sense for a video game. After all, I mean, really, you should be building it within the engine itself and really not doing this whole export thing for Maya to make things work. Only reason I do that is just because it seems to make things simpler. What you're seeing now is I'm starting to go through and I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to make these different areas work. And now I'm adjusting uh, the tile on the floor. Um, now the tile on the floor is uh, this white with a light blue diamond in the center. Problem is that the diamond on this particular material is way too large. And unfortunately, there's no parameter in this particular material that lets me change the size of the diamond. So what I'm probably gonna need to do is at some point jump down into Sub Substance Designer and actually begin creating my own materials. And unfortunately, at this time, I'm just starting to really get my head around Substance Designer and uh, I'm doing some tutorials and uh, some interesting video stuff that I found to try to get a better sense of how it works. But at the time of recording this, I hadn't started doing anything yet with it. So that's why I'm kind of battling with this particular material, trying to figure out what works best. And I'm going through and also looking to see if there are alternative designs within this material that might actually work. In this case, roughness ceramic tiles. I'm trying to see if there's anything that will actually look pretty good. Now, the usual process for me is, of course, I have a Substance Painter folder. Inside of there, I have my FBX files, my textures, and my Substance saves. And I try to keep everything separate from one another just because I'm dealing with a project where I have multiple students also working on it. And while they're not directly working off my Google Drive, they are placing objects on there. And in case something gets messed up, I like to be able to have them just have a backup in another folder next to it. Keeping everything separate and not directly working with an Unity folder just makes my life a lot easier when things go wrong. And things go wrong very often. Um, pivots are wrong, other objects are wrong, textures are wrong, seams are wrong. Um, whenever you're working with a team of people, you've got to kind of deal with that. And since I'm not only a team member, but also basically the manager of the project, I have to make sure that everyone is kind of falling in line. Now, I'm battling in my head right now how I'm going to handle creating these different assets. And I'm, I'm actually screwing everything up right now. I'm not doing a very good job. And once again, I'm on the cusp of where I'm trying to think, okay, how much am I doing in Maya and how much am I going to be doing inside of Unity? And I'm creating these basic uh, ceiling and floor elements. But what I'm going to realize very shortly is that I, I completely do this wrong. Um, in fact, one of the things that I do really stupidly is I make um, the elements uh, an odd number size. That is, they're five units wide or three units wide. And that really restricts my ability to uh, lay out the level inside of Unity. So eventually, very soon, I'm going to completely give up on what I'm doing and I'm going to go back in there and retexture things. Here I'm looking at different elements that I can add. I really like the broken up element of the underlying brick in that particular case, but really there's not going to be brick above you, so it makes no sense for ceiling. In addition, that particular material, you can't separate. There's actually two colors for the uh, wall. I can't separate that information out in that material. So that's a huge restriction on that material. I, I wish they would make it so you could actually change that other, other paint layer. At least I didn't see anything when I was working on it. So once again, bringing those elements into Unity, seeing how they're looking. And as I'm doing this, my, my mind is, you know, churning. It's trying to figure out how I'm going to make this thing actually work. And, and that's kind of when I realized I, I need to make this modular and I need to make this easy for other people to, to use uh, at the end of the day. So very soon, so here I'm, I'm starting to bring out uh, different Unity elements to block out the sunlight so I can get a better sense of what shadows are going to get cast. And I have my, in my mind, I have this idea for how this is going to look as sort of the golden hour of the day where the light is going to be streaming into the windows. It's going to be more of a yellow hint to the color. And that's just kind of my idea for how the final scene is going to look. Okay, so at this point, 
I have that five by five element, I have that three by three element, and I'm trying to make it work. And once again, I'm working inside of Maya, and I'm going to struggle with this for a little bit, uh, export this asset out as well, take a look at it inside of Substance Painter uh, very shortly. But as you can see, I'm starting to make weird cuts all over the place. I'm, I'm making like a one by four element, and then I have this three by three and a five by five, and none of it really makes any sense. Um, I'm going to need to create multiple elements of different sizes that I can reuse, uh, evens and odd sizes. And that's what's going to happen very shortly once I kind of struggle with placing these wall elements and realizing that I've got elements that are too big or too small, or different parts of it are just not the size that I want. So I do have a 3 by 5 tall uh, window element, which very shortly I'm going to duplicate and make it twice as wide because it just ends up working with the geometry of the layout. But after this long, I finally just decide, you know what, Let, let's stop this nonsense. Let's make the different elements. We're going to do a 4x4, four four, we're going to do a 3x3, three three, and a 2x2. Two two. And uh, actually, I think I do a 5x5 five five as well, which is what you just saw right there. And that's going to be the other side of the soup kitchen. So one side is where they're preparing the meals, the other side is where they're actually sitting and, you know, eating everything. And one of the kind of the smallest area that I envision having is that three by three element you see in that windowed area up at the top. And that becomes sort of my basis for the rest of the sizes because if you're moving around and navigating this area, that's kind of the minimum amount of space that you're going to need to make sure you don't intersect anything or you're not hitting anything. As you can see, I finally duplicate that wall a second time to add another window. I just feel like having more light streaming in from that side, if I position the sun on that side of things. Uh, will just make the kitchen really pop. So more lights is better. Once again, now in Substance Painter, and here is where I start duplicating things, and I'm really getting an idea of how I'm going to be tackling this whole um, constructing inside of Unity thing. And while it, it seems superficial, it seems uh, stupidly simple, and it's like, duh, George, why aren't you doing this earlier? It does for me at this time reflect a paradigm shift in how I'm going to be approaching this entire project. So I do kind of hesitate and I do take longer than I probably should at just doing it because it does change how everything that I'm going to do and it, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with doing it this way. Uh, yeah, it, it's a bit of a struggle getting started. And that's why it's taking so long for me to finally export these out. But when I finally do, I end up just uh, duplicating elements, creating the floor element, the ceiling element at five by five down to two by two elements. I don't think I need a one by one. It just seems overkill to do that. If I'm smart, I can get a one by one just by mixing and matching the even and odd sizes of things or just two odds or, you know, so forth and so on. Okay, so exporting out a lot of different assets. Now I'm going to be working on the wall elements. All wall elements in this particular area are going to be the same height. They're going to be five units tall. That's just the way it's going to work. And we're going to uh, subtract the width of each one down to make it a three by a four by three, excuse me, a four by five, a three by five and a two by five. We're also going to make window elements shortly that reflect uh, several of these different sizes. I'm also making sure that everything's lined up on the z-axis looking forward so I just have a you know a consistent convention that I can rely on so that whenever I'm bringing assets in I know that I'm going to have to rotate them 90 or 180 degrees to make things work out right. All right yeah boring it's just exporting things out um, and then I remember I don't know about you but I played a long time ago the leaked version of Half-Life 2 back when it got uh, leaked someone hacked their system and, and got it. Uh, and one of the coolest things was actually not, I mean, the game was awesome, but at the same time was seeing uh, a game in construction and how they were dealing with things like missing textures and seams. And I was looking up Half-Life 2 to remember how they were dividing up the different areas inside of their source engine. And it was, it was a whim. I didn't find anything or information about it, but I just remember them actually having textures that were say like three by five units tall or four by four units tall or whatever. Uh, to indicate that this needed to be replaced at some time with that particular size, we just don't have a texture yet. So it'd probably be a good idea for me to, at some point, create textures like that and insert them in here so that a person could really lay out the entire level, and then we just replace those textures when necessary. And the great thing is, as you play them, then you can go remind your texture artist um, to get their ass moving to, to make sure things are actually done. So we're, all us we're using the same texture for each one of these, and this might come back to bite me in the butt later on. But uh, it's, it's, it's tiling right now, I've set it up so that it'll work. Uh, it's just that when you do things like this, uh, the ceiling is going to become a problem because I do have some odd specular, I call them specular highlights, I guess you can't really call that that anymore um, with, with the pipeline we're working through. But uh, now going through, taking a look at the different materials, once again, Substance Painter, I spend a lot of time in Substance Source trying to find something good. 
Uh, I was looking for a European type of wood because a lot of these are uh, North American, at least that I can tell. Uh, and that's more what I'm familiar with, but it's obviously not what they're going to have in Warsaw, Poland in the 1940s. So in this case, what are we looking at? Parquet? Parquet? European ash? I'm not sure how to pronounce that first word. You'll notice that I desaturate a lot of these things, and once again, it's just kind of the feeling of the entire mood of the environment. Um, I do have people consistently looking every now and then at the progress that we're doing, and one of the one of the some of the feedback that I've gotten is that things are either too bright or they look too nice or they're not dirty enough. And I'm kind of fighting this entire mindset. Once again, things like that, especially desaturation, are post-processing filters that we can add later on. But because I am kind of fighting people as I develop this and they're seeing, you know, not the final version, and I can't really explain to them that it's going to look different uh, and, and have their trust sometimes. So I am kind of incorporating that a little bit into the materials. So. Yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword there. I'm, I'm getting better feedback, um, and they kind of have a better sense of how things are going to look. But really, I should probably jump in here and throw a post-processing stack on top of this and just desaturate the entire thing slightly, just to give them a better sense. That way I'm really not tainting my textures with this, this thought of how things should look. So I just created those other doors, uh, excuse me, not doors. Uh, I will be creating doors at some point. I haven't done that yet. I was creating window frames um, or window walls that the frame will fit into, and they're all set to work with that one frame. Now that I've done this, I can finally actually start constructing a new scene. So this is the actual soup kitchen scene, at least my first attempt at it, and I'm just testing out the modularity of everything, how well I can construct something with these different components I've created. And here, things are working pretty well. I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, when I'm going to be using a 5x5, 4x4, 3x3. Got that 3x3 in the upper uh, left-hand corner. Now I'm adding my walls in. And once again, it's a little bit of a struggle for me, just figuring out how I'm going to lay things out. I'm going to end up bleeding elements back and forth, getting used to this new pipeline of development for myself. Once again, that's the wrong size, so i got to put a 2x2. Two two. And because I know scenes will eventually be some kind of an issue, I do try to hide the smaller elements off in the corners and uh, pushing them in places where you won't see so much. Now, I believe I'm going to need uh, three or four of these uh, tables, and I'm trying to get a sense of scale at this point. And I realize that those tables are far too wide across, and I want things to be a little bit more crowded. So I go ahead and I play around with positioning these different elements, and what I end up with is kind of like a one unit separation between each window. Well, I don't have a one by five segment that I've created, and really what I need there is a um, is sort of an outcropping. So I'm going to end up creating that shortly after I go through and create the ceiling. And what you'll notice with the ceiling is this is where I get a little bit of a problem with that gloss on the ceiling um, with the reflection component and things aren't looking terribly good. So I'm going to have to fix that soon. Okay, so we've gone ahead and we've laid out the basic parts of most of this level. Now I'm just taking some time to group things together to make sure that my hierarchy isn't terribly, you know, packed with all kinds of information. So I'm making sure to separate things based on ceiling, floor, and wall in this case. Just uh, put an underscore in front of it so they all go to the top as well. Just makes my life a lot easier. Now it's about time for us to deal with this column, and uh, I'm going to create two different columns actually. So I take the reference part of the model and I use that as a base, and I'm going to create a 2x2x5 two by two by tall element, and we're going to uh, square it up and also add uh, subdivisions inside of the object to make it um, just... I don't know why I'm doing this, I think I'm just trying to keep with the unit system, and it, I guess I am throwing away polygons, but it just seems like it might work better. Also, I'm interested in seeing how this will have a, an impact on the lighting calculations. I feel like if everyone has vertices in the same position, in the same place, my lighting calcs might actually come out a lot better. Go ahead and nuke the bottom and top of this as well, because it's going to be in a room where I don't have to worry about a bottom and a top. It's, it's five units tall, it'll go right up to the ceiling to the floor. Also add a bevel to the sides, which may be a mistake in the long run, because it means I can't put these together. But at the same time, I feel like you're going to have a rounded element there on the wall and having a harsh 90 degree angle is just going to look like crap, and you can't really normal away a 90 degree angle, it's going to look like junk. So might as well uh, just put the uh, stuff in there. Now I realize that when I put it in there, it's just too large, and uh, I can use this on the side element, and which I'll do later on, but for those one areas, I need to reduce the size of this. So I go ahead and scale it on down, or actually make it fit to the grid, and keep all those seams, which is possibly a mistake. I may, probably should have deleted that internal uh, middle seam because there's really that's a half a unit size which doesn't make any sense for my scaling but it's fine 
Now, I do use the same texture that I end up developing for the 2x2, two two, which means that my paint's going to be at a slightly different scale than the rest of the elements, but it's fine. It's not too much of an issue. And I reuse that column element off to the side. Once again, this is based off of not only real life reference material, but also a video clip from a movie that came out about Warsaw in Poland. And I'm trying to blend the two worlds and not exactly easy, you know, running away from my reference material. I, I'm still kind of using it maybe a little excessively. I should probably start thinking about different ways of laying the, the place out. But the good news is actually next week, uh, we have our first sort of uh, viewing of the demo by non-professionals in the computer graphics industry. So I'm going to get some great feedback and at that time we can see whether or not things work out. Now I'm creating sort of a little uh, banister that where people are going to come and actually get their soup. So this is sort of the transition between the soup kitchen area and the actual eatery area. Um, I'm going to leave the tops and bottoms on, or at least the bottoms on in this case, uh, because I don't know how I'm going to be using this element in the future. And it just seems like it's a better idea to keep that polygon there rather than try to optimize it to, to you know, insanity. Um, I think some somewhere I might actually need that bottom. Here laying out the UVs and uh, lately I'm, I'm being a lot more careful with my UVs. I'm not letting Maya um, take as much control using the automatic UV layouts. Uh, I'm very careful now about rotations just to try to speed up my, my workflow because there's so many assets that need to be created. Taking your time to make sure your, uh, your UVs are oriented in the right direction just means you have less layers you have to put in Substance Painter and you have less rotations on sp uh, specific materials you have to deal with, just makes things go a lot better. So here, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have a paint, uh, the blue paint on the bottom, and we're gonna have a wood texture on the top. In this case, I'm gonna end up using the wood rough material, just because this is an area, a transition area between one area and the other, where people are gonna be constantly putting plates and bowls and spoons and all kinds of stuff. So I feel like it, uh, a rough material is gonna go a lot better. Now there's an interesting little clip error right there. We saw a little triangle that turned white. I'm not sure what that was, but it disappears after a little bit. Now we're playing around with adding nails to the surface. I'm not exactly sure how I want to handle this. So I believe I end up putting nails just kind of in the center point of it. That way, when I put them together, I don't have two nails butted up right against each other, um, looking really awkward. Instead, they're always going to be equally distant spaced apart from one another. Export everything out, bring it into Unity. And this is where I notice a problem. Uh, as I duplicate this object several times and try to line it up, I notice a massive seam uh, and it looks like at some point I had accidentally used the rotate tool to rotate or I just grab things and move them around. So we go in vertex mode, make sure that everything's lined up perfectly on both sides. As you can see here, I picked the, the smaller of the two sides, re-export this out. The UVs are negligibly different at this point. It shouldn't really matter. The only problem that I do have is I got a little bit of a normal seam between the two elements, and that's something that I can handle later on. Um, I'm really not going to deal with it at this point. So go ahead and place in those different columns. There's a two by two column I mentioned before, looking pretty good. Now I need to add a location in the back for the pantry where you're going to place all the different objects on these different shelves. And I kind of, I don't know why the heck I did it this way, but I end up being very dumb in how I approach the shelf. You can see I started with a cube and I split it up and I used a bevel to then make little tiny shelves. I really should have just made one shelf and then one side element and duplicated it instead of going through here and, and messing around with all these subdivisions and having to delete edges afterwards and insert them back in. Made no sense whatsoever. So here, just playing around with the size of the wood. Um, the basic shape is it's a very simple shelf. Um, I also start adding some subdivisions, bevels and so forth, uh, because I know I'm going to need them later on. Uh, in this case, I also want some cross bracing in the back. I don't know, I've been watching, I think, too many videos online of warehouses where people don't properly brace things and everything collapses to the ground and basically uh, ruins the entire warehouse. So I look at some bracing online and most of the bracing that I see is, is cross bracing it with an X and I decide ah, I'll just do bracing every other direction. Uh, close enough, good enough. Um, I couldn't find any real reference of how the bracing would look at that time. I just, I don't know. So I've screwed some things up and now I'm going through and repairing some weird bevels that I accidentally created. And it actually takes some time because the bevels don't work. Uh, the edge loop tool grabs the wrong things based upon the bevel that I created. Now I'm going through and unwrapping things and this is actually pretty simple. Each side is basically going to get split apart. And I do play around with trying to just let it naturally kind of split apart, but I end up just grabbing each side and flattening it out. Um, 
I really should have grabbed my UVs and just, I believe actually I do apply one, uh, I, I apply the top shelf to the bottom shelf uh, using mesh and then transfer attributes. Doing the same thing over here to these side elements as well. Um, just UV unwrapping them, bottoms and sides, just makes sense. I am going to add a cut as you saw there in the center of those objects. That way they're not super long and when I go ahead and I lay out my object, I don't have to worry about it using the size of the object instead of the entire UV texture space. Adding some cuts on those side elements as well. Uh, you know, in, the, in a perfect world, those cuts probably should have been slightly diagonal. Would have made more sense. Uh, I could have uh, rotated those elements, but it's, it's fine. It'll work for what we're doing. And uh, at this point, I've got pretty much everything. Rotate them and put everything in one space, lay them out. And this is where I do start to get, oh, Maya crashed at that point. That's fun. So yeah, UV mode, I don't know why, but Maya always is a little flakier in UV mode. What I'm doing here is I'm looking at them. I'm trying to figure out the best way to make this work. And I, like I said, I'm being a lot more careful with my UV layouts. I want this to be easier for me to work with. So I'm trying to keep everyone lined up in the same direction. Uh, so all of the side elements are one direction. All of the up and down elements are the same direction. Um, just to make my, my life easier. Now we go ahead and export everything out. 2048 map, the usual. Uh, bake some stuff. Now I start looking at different kinds of wood. And I end up using a kind of like a more fresh looking wood, or I don't know, a saturated kind of wood in this case. We gotta dial back those normals and those height map intensities though. They're really extreme. Um, shouldn't look like that. And we already noticed we got some problems. So I go ahead and mask out the sides. I take the cedar wood, I rotate it 90 degrees, and uh, that gives me a pattern going vertically instead of horizontally. Now I'm trying to figure out how I can add this rotten wood just to add some, some you know, flavor to the, how this whole thing looks. Also adding a rust layer. Rust is used that way too often probably, but it's just a great way to add some dirt here and there to the um, oral structure. Now going through adding our uh, nail holes to the entire thing. Pretty quick and easy, not much to talk about here. I do make sure that when I'm do using the nail, I use the custom material as opposed to the default one, just because I find that to be too metallic, too reflection, too much of a, it has too much reflectivity in it. Uh, this looks a lot better. Now I'm playing around with trying to add some sort of a gradient from top to bottom, but I'm not really successful in getting the look that I want. So I end up kind of abandoning that. And I just add some more dirt here and there. Um, and, and that works pretty fine. At this point, things are looking pretty good. I don't really need to worry too much about it. Go ahead and export our assets out and uh, bring them into Unity as usual. Oh, I forgot to add those nails, it looks like. So we go ahead and do another export, bring them on over and uh, jump into Unity and see how this is going to look. This asset's going to be used twice in the back element right there. Uh, the idea is that these shelves are going to be crammed with all kinds of things necessary to make the soup kitchen function. So there you can see the two right there. And hopefully over the next week, as I get more assets from students, I'll be able to fill those shelves with interesting things. Now at this time, I start looking at uh, two of the students' packages that they provided me. Um, Two of our students, Ardit and Garrett. Uh, Ardit's been with the lab for a while. Garrett's kind of doing work for the summer, but he's got a background in Unity, so he can actually pull some interesting stuff together. And now this is where I put on my teaching hat or manager hat, and I load all their assets in. And uh, that email there is me pretty much saying, all right, this is what's wrong with this asset, because as soon as I load them up, I start seeing issues. Um, you know, some of them are fine, uh, but there's some stretching on the UVs that I notice, and they're working in Blender. I don't know why, but it just seems like Blender has a bad default. Oh, there you can see those UVs on the top and on the bottom are pretty nasty. Knife is fine, uh, but we're kind of discussing things like, okay, ladle, kettle, pot, cooking lid pot. Um, I'm asking them to please you know, fix these problems. Now we load an Ardit. Now, unfortunately, Ardit's stuff uh, is a little bit different. Uh, he loaded it in and not in his own file or not in his own folder. So things kind of get perverted. That is his files kind of intermingle with mine, which kind of messes things up. But I noticed that his materials aren't even applied and didn't even create prefabs for me to, to assess, so I'm not even going to deal with that. Now I'm going through and I'm looking at the different elements uh, that haven't been completed yet, and I realized that if I want to work off are the students' uh, stuff they created, I need to have the latest version of Blender. I had a uh, alpha version or beta version, I forget what it was, of Blender at the moment, so why not install the final version of 2.8? This is Bread, I believe. I don't know, if, I don't know who made it. I think uh, it looks like Garrett made it. Um, so I export this out of Blender and uh, as an FBX file, and I'm going to load it into Maya because, of course, that's where I'm most comfortable. 
So inside of Maya, we load up our bread. Now I need to load up a scene that already has the scale set properly with meters and so forth. So I do that first, and then I bring our bread down to size, and then I export the bread element down. You'll notice I, I have a photograph of a person uh, that's used as scale roughly to make sure things are kind of correct. And now I begin playing around with how this whole asset looks. And I'm not sure if I'm doing a great job or not. I'm just kind of playing. And uh, I, I feel like I can get rid of a lot of these seams and make things a lot clearer. Um, round out some different elements, and here, really, it's just about playing around, seeing where I can uh, reduce the poly count, because we're probably going to have lots of pieces of bread. So why not triangulate it manually, and uh, duplicate that after I'm done, delete the middle seam, and see what we get. So what are we at to? We're at 92 verts, 180 tries on this particular object, which is still probably a bit excessive, uh, but it's, it's fine. It'll work. Go ahead and re-UV unwrap this object because it looked like the UVs were not properly set up previously. Things were scaled awkwardly. I think what's happening is they're not keeping width and height ratios proper. So now we bring our bread in a substance painter, but that's kind of when I realized, you know what, I don't have a uh, bread. I don't have a bread material. There's really no food materials on the substance source. So we try out Alchemist uh, for kind of the first time. And I start to just, I grab a piece of bread, bring it in here, see what's going on. I mean, I played with Alchemist before you saw with the potato, but this is where I'm actually trying to really take my time with it and figure out how to make a proper image, making sure the lighting is proper uh, so that things tile. And I kind of succeed, this is all right, but you know, I gotta tell you that it looks more like sponge to me than bread at the end of the day. Once again, I don't know what I'm doing very well. I'm still experimenting with this program, getting a sense of it. I probably should really read the documentation on it. That would probably help out a lot. Uh, but once again, uh, I'm not doing that. I'll probably, I, I have to check to see if Substance has a good set of tutorials. Their Substance tutorials are pretty good. So if they have something comparable to, for Alchemist, uh, it shouldn't be too hard to, to learn. I go in and I check my normals because things look kind of messed up. And I go ahead and I create a high resolution version of this object. Um, the idea being that I'll get some nice curves on the sides of this thing when I uh, create the normal map. Nothing terribly interesting, but you know, it should be fine. Export it out, check out my normals again, bake everything, bring the bread in there. And I kept the, I believe I kept the texture low, like at 512, but I also need a texture for the outside of the bread as well. And I find this kind of bun or, you know, this loaf of bread and I just sort of start trying to make something work. Not exactly sure what I'm doing at this point. Uh, I'm just playing around with things. It's all experimental here. I don't know what I'm doing. Bring it on over, see the seams. We of course make that make it tile advanced thing and I'm playing with it and what I end up doing is I duplicate the mesh across from itself and try to paint out some of the seams and bring that over into Substance Alchemist instead. And here I'm trying to add some detail back in so that it's a little less um, mirrored across the entire surface. And that works out somewhat. And when I bring it in here, I just find it seems to work a little bit better having uh, it duplicated and having a natural sort of tiling going on with the texture as opposed to having it completely different. And I end up with this kind of weird thing. Now I do go through and I believe I invert the height values because this kind of looks sunken in. There we go. So you can see now they're popping out more for the top of the loaf. And what I'm gonna pretty much use this for is I'm just gonna paint it onto the sides. Uh, so there we go ahead, put it around there. I'm playing around with the the location of it and the projection to see if I can make it look any better. You know, it's not really 100% great, but at the same time, this is only 512 texture, so I'm kind of giving myself a little bit of leeway here. I probably should go in there and manipulate the UVs to add more. But what I'm doing here is, uh, you know, bread naturally has a transition from the outside to the inside, so I'm just trying to paint in a little bit of brown in there to make that look a little bit more interesting and maybe make the normals a little bit better as well. So now we bring our bread over in a, into Unity, and I kind of got to give myself some slack. It's a piece of bread. It's not going to be looked up super close. Um, it's just there really to fill out more of the space. So I notice some problems with the normal map, and I go through there and I recreate a high resolution one, and I go back into Substance Painter. I want to rebake that one on there just because things were. I, sometimes I forget that when I bring an asset over from Blender, for some reason the normals are locked, and I have to unlock those normals. That's another thing that I have to fix because the normals weren't turning out right. But then I also export out the high resolution one, bring them all in together, and uh, kind of just make things work out. 
here things are much better. The normals aren't all screwy um, on the surface of the object because I've made it better. Now, one thing I do notice is that it's way too metallic and I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, what I don't like right now about Alchemist is, and I probably just don't know how to use the program right, but it seems like when I export out my new materials, I'm I don't have nearly as much control as I expect. And there's gotta be some option to let me affect the materials directly. Um, there I'm going through and I'm making sure that all of my export stuff is set up right because th I just can't get things to look right. I mean, look how reflective that surface is. That's basically metal bread at that point and it's just not working out. So what I end up doing is I create another layer and then I uh, mask out all the layers except for rough metal and color. Um, actually, I don't know why I have color on there, but really what I'm trying to affect is the metal and the roughness of that particular object. And I'm trying to give it layers because what I think is happening is that I don't have any roughness material or any 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 of those components in the mesh that I'm exporting. And I'm go jumping back and forth trying to get this thing to actually work. Finally, it seems like it looks good. I, I don't have that uh, sheen, that quality so much. And now it's time for us to start uh, looking at some of the assets that the students created. And here I look at the scale. And one, this isn't the scale that I originally wanted. I wanted one of those ones with the two sides where you put weights on one side to figure out the amount on the other. But I decide, you know what, why not have multiple types of scale? So we'll, we'll give this one a shot. But if you look at this scale, it's very cartoony, it's very rounded out. It, it's basically a scale where this, the person put the smooth shader or the smooth modifier right on top of it when they were done. And it just looks like a mess. Not only that, but it's like 3,000 or 3,500 3, polygons. I think we can do better and make it look a lot more detailed without so much waste. So here's me creating my own version of that scale based on some of the reference material you saw before. In this case, we have a sunken in area, which is the gauge, which will tell you how much it weighs. And one thing about me is I don't typically use the smooth modifiers until the very end, and I know when I'm going to use it for very specific objects. And I try to stay away from it as much as possible because I know I'm going to have to go in there and delete a lot of excess detail. And also I'm going to have to add a lot of edge loops to constrain how that thing looks. So I do a lot of hard surface modeling instead beforehand. And here I'm making the top part, which is going to hold the scale. And it basically has four prongs. That's what I'm trying to figure out right now making the four prongs that are gonna come out the side. Here I'm making the bowl that's gonna sit within that dish. This is gonna be a separate object. They're all gonna be grouped together uh, as part of the scale itself. Uh, there I uh, ex extruded out, that was the easiest way to do it. And now I'm tinkering around, adding a lip to the top of it as well. And you'll see me play around with this a lot. I expand the size of the bowl so it's a little bit thinner and uh, also pull up the top of it as well. Centering things out, that's another thing that, that I get a big problem with with students uh, is they don't center stuff, they don't check their pivots at all. I'm using a Bezier curve because why the heck not? It's just easier to do this. So I, I use the curve, I extrude this up and that makes a perfect, you know, sort of, what is it, cusp or rounding element to hold that, that bowl in place. I'm gonna grab those, duplicate them, rotate them 90 degrees as a group and then uh, combine them back to the original stuff by adding additional detail and then merging those together. Yes, I could just leave them floating, but I like to, when I can, I like to combine my surfaces together. That just means that at the end of the day, when you're rendering things out, those, those points are exactly in the same position. You're not gonna have any kind of weird gaps or seams or anything else for that matter, or Z-buffer problems. Just makes your life easier at the end of the day by throwing in a little extra detail to make things look right. I optimize a little bit. I reduce down things to a triangle at the top. Now I'm going through and I'm trying to create the, um, the, the gauge or the, the needles on the gauge that are going to turn around. And what I end up doing is I create a cylinder, rotate it, work in object space, but then I kind of screw up and I rotate the object. And really I should have tried to, uh, I should have rotated the object uh, when it was on the major axes and then fixed everything. What you're gonna see me is struggling with this kind of like 12 or 10 degree offset through the entire thing, which kind of stinks. There you can see I pulled it off to the side. Now I'm playing around with using the move settings and using the different custom tools to make sure that I extrude across the normal of that surface, which goes straight up, adding in some insert edge loops to make a pulled out part. Um, and then we're going to scale down that top. Once again, a lot of manipulation of my axes, making sure that I have the right coordinate system that I'm working within to make this whole thing work. And sometimes it bites me in the butt how I decided to do this, but for the most part, I get it done. It might not be exactly symmetric, you know, like down to 0 0.01 units, but it's pretty close. Duplicate that element, move it down, move the insides into the elements so that they are hidden, and then I scale down the second needle as well. I leave them all at the top. 
uh, because if I do decide to make this somewhat functional, I'll, I'll want those elements to be separate objects that can be rotated inside of Unity. Now we're end ending up towards the, uh, oh, it's towards the end of the model. So I, of course, added those bevels in there because that's what you do. At least I always thought that you should always add bevels at the end because bevels are kind of like that last step you add in there and can really make it difficult to manipulate your geometry after the bevels have been added. Now I'm going through renaming things, regrouping things, figuring out the right way to make things work and scaling it back to a size comparable to the slice of bread that I had. So I always try to make sure I have some object in the scene from the previous scene so I get a sense of scale. Uh, and that's another problem with the students is that they will not scale their objects. So I'll get things that are 100 units by 100 units too large or maybe way too small. They just don't spend the time to you know, do all these small little things you need to make sure the asset looks right. Okay. Now we've got the, the fun of unwrapping. There's going to be two materials on this object. One is going to be for the glass on the, on the front. Obviously we have it as a separate material and a separate object so that it renders separately. And it has a, it's used later in the rendering queue so that the transparencies will look proper. The rest of the object is going to be completely opaque. Therefore it's on its own separate material. We go ahead and separate the two sides and this is pretty easy to unwrap, not too much of a challenge. Uh, actually, the most of the challenge comes in with the uh, the prongs at the top, which is kind of just a lot of awkward geometry. So I kind of go in and uh, all the rest of it's easy, just plainer stuff. But here I'm going through and I'm going to do the front and the back as separate elements. And I'm going to go into the prongs and I'm going to uh, cut them up. So there's an inside and then the rest of it that kind of just folds outwards, which will make things work pretty well. And uh, yeah, here I'm going through the top cutting that off as well. And it, you're really not going to get a sense of what the UVs look like until right there where I start doing the projections. And now I'm going through and I'm grabbing those little elements on the sides so that they fold out flatter, making things a little bit better for my UVs. Now I've got pretty much everything done at this point except for the needles. So all we do here is we uh, separate the back out and I leave the front as one intact object and just let it unfold naturally. That way they're stuck together somewhat and the, the, the tiling or the the uh, materials will gradually flow over the surface a little bit more like they're supposed to. I won't have seams to deal with as much. Now I've got everything done. Uh, I export everything out to Substance Painter and it's time to work inside of there. So this is an interesting one. The metal flat material or the, the painted uh, metal material works just fine. Uh, I throw a glass on there first, a scale. Um, the idea is it's, it's a kitchen, so there's probably going to be some dirt. Is there really glass in front of this thing? I don't know. Possibly, possibly not. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the glass just adds, the, the, the scaling just adds another level of detail like flour and stuff down all over the surface. So that painted material does a great job. It's just a little bit too blue. I forget to adjust that, I'll do it later. But really the old, only other thing that I need to add is some sort of a rust element to this entire thing. And that's what you're seeing here is me going back and forth and just trying to figure out how it's going to look. I'm not loving the rust and I am going to go back and forth a lot and try to figure out exactly how to make this look interesting. What you'll notice is there's sort of a weird whitish seam going on there. I'm not sure what's coming up from that. So I go in there and I start painting directly on it. And that's partly because I forgot to turn on the layer below it. Uh, but then I start adding the rust and you know, it, it's fine. I don't do a whole lot of painting. I don't know why I don't. Um, for some reason, I just let the algorithms do its thing as much as possible. But in this case, it, it seemed necessary. Now I'm playing around with the, the glass surface and I'm trying to figure out how to get that highlight really nice on the surface. But I don't want it to be too overbearing. I also go in there and try to add a layer of, not rust, but dirt around the edges. And here I'm going to play with that. I'm going to, uh, also it turns out that I have some sort of transparency coming through because I made it transparent in Maya, which is kind of annoying. I couldn't find a way to turn that off. So it seems like I double transparency the object, which is just, I don't know. It, it seemed like a pain in the butt. Once again, playing around more with that rust. What I'm going to end up doing is adding multiple rust layers. Uh, right now I'm playing around a lot with, with the, the mask itself because I'm going to need a paper element on that inside part go through, I find kind of an interesting parchment paper that looks a little bit more worn. I'm going to have to play with that a lot though to make sure it's not too overbearing. So I'm going to go down and adjust the creases especially and the pleat on that surface. One thing I notice is as I increase the age, it almost seems like it becomes transparent. It begins to pick up this blue color, which I just don't like. So I, I decrease the age and then I go through instead and I start painting on, I create a second layer of it and I overlay that on top of it. So I get a little bit of yellowing, but nothing too much. 
Now I'm trying to go through and trying to find an image that isn't copyrighted uh, so I can actually use it. And eventually I find someone who just uploaded a picture of one of their clock faces. And this just works fine for me. And in Photoshop, we play around with making sure this look, looks fine. We heal it a little bit here. I rotate things. I use my grid to make sure that I've aligned things somewhat to the center and that things are somewhat balanced. I don't need it to be perfect, but I definitely can do better than the way it was before. Now I'm trying to see if I need to invert the uh, the intensities, the the, uh, the brightness of the object, because sometimes if you invert it and then blur it and then overlay it, you can get rid of some of the darks and the lights to make it look a little bit more neutral as if it was taken under neutral lighting and uh, kind of play around with that. Now I gotta admit, I don't use the, uh, the stencil tool very often. That was an attempt to try it. Instead, I just decide, you know what? I'm just gonna use the brush tool with a texture on it. I'm just gonna try until I get this to look somewhat correct. And you'll notice it's also on that needle, which I'll fix later on, but I just wanna get that light texture on that surface. And that's pretty much what we achieve right here. It looks just fine except for the fact that I really didn't uh, change my roughness values. Uh, and instead of trying to reproject that onto the surface again, I just go and create another layer and I, I paint directly onto the roughness channel and the metal, metal channel to reduce how metallic it is. Now I'm trying to get the inside and outside to blend a little bit better. That parchment paper isn't working perfectly. Things are a little bit darker on that surface than I expected. And I'm just playing. Um, eventually I go in there and I just create, I just kind of blend the two layers lightly. Um, it's not perfect towards the bottom where it's a little bit darker, but it works more towards the top where things blend naturally a little bit better. Of course, I got to clean things up. That projection went a little bit too crazy right there. So make sure that's all right. And then I go ahead and add another rust layer on top of everything because it's just not quite where I want it to be. I dial back the oranginess of it a little bit as well. And I make sure it's not too crazy, but the two layers working together kind of seems to work out well for me. Go ahead and export out all my assets. Once again, move the FBX over there as well. And then we bring that into Unity and uh, make sure it's all set up. This is my default scene where I bring most things in and I create my prefabs just so I have one scene where it's like all the assets are kind of put together. Um, and it's good too, because at the end of the day, if my boss or someone else asks me like, okay, what have you actually gotten done? I can just load this scene up and be like, check out all these individual assets. And it, it, it's nice because maybe you won't use some in this particular scene, but you can still show that a lot of work has gotten done. So we put the scale up on the shelves. I don't know where else to put it at this point. We don't have a lot of uh, tables to work with back there, which is something that I'm going to have to fix shortly. Now, uh, I start importing in that the students at this point were supposed to have finished their assets and fixed them. Uh, I go ahead and add a reflection probe in there, but I start noticing things like check out the underside of that pot. There's big old opening right there. And, what I'm doing right now is actually writing an email to the student telling them you need to fix this stuff. Your, your UVs are also still kind of wonky. You need to fix that as well. And I look at this table, check out those the, the, the horrible seams on the sides of that thing and the stretching going on. So at this point, I'm like, I need a, I need a tail, I, a tail. I need a, a table. I need, uh, I think my kids have been playing tattletale a lot. So I think that's why I said tail. Um, but I need a table that's gonna work for me. And then I start going into the other student's assets here, the coat hanger. Uh, first of all, I have a huge problem with it being called a coat hanger because to me a coat hanger is, you know, one of those plastic or metal things that holds a jacket up in a, in a closet. Uh, so this to me is a coat rack. And once again, you'll notice the scales are all over the place and I can't have this in my scene. I need the scales to be proper. Uh, the reason for that is because I don't know what kinds of scripts we're going to use, but if we start moving objects around and I need a, like a default scale, I want it to be as close to one as possible so I don't have to save whatever the special scale of the object is as a variable in my code and then reapply it when I, you know, undo whatever it is I've done. Just simplifies the algorithms. So I bring in that, uh, that crate because the crate's going to be used to hold potatoes and other kinds of food. Uh, obviously they have tons of, if it's soup kitchen serving hundreds of people, you know, they're going to have lots of crates of things. Go into Substance Painter with that crate and uh, the UVs are laid out fine enough. Um, there's a lot, there's, that's a pretty big gap for 2048 by 2048. I don't know why Blender did that, but uh, that's what it did. It laid out all of its little islands and uh, bake everything out. And for the most part, I'm using the original texture that this student created, uh, arted. Um, but I am gonna go in there, I'm gonna dirty up the wood. I do add a wood rough on top of that with a, um, a mask as well, just to bring things down a step. You know, it doesn't need to look like it's the best looking thing in the world. It needs to look a little bit dirty. You know, it's been moving potatoes, dirt, and all kinds of stuff around. It, it should be a little bit more uh, grungy. So now that I've, I've made that work out, we're gonna bring that in to our test scene as usual. And uh, 
bring in our materials, map them to it properly, assess it to whether see it works right, make a prefab of that object, and then with that prefab done, we can of course jump into the main scene and then check things out. Now I'm gonna fix that coat rack really fast. First thing, of course, is that pivot. That pivot needs to be fixed. And I create a box to see how tall it is. That would be six feet tall, that's too tall, so I kind of bring it down a little bit. And now I start playing with the UVs and I look at them like, okay, some of this can be fixed. First of all, as soon as I, I, um, I unwrap those, you'll notice that that one part became really big, which means that that was compressed in one axis, which is a big no-no. Um, once again, I'm playing around with the normals a lot. You'll see me playing around with them in just a few seconds, and that's because, once again, I forget to unlock the normals. For some reason, they always come in locked from Blender, and it's annoying as all heck. Uh, see here, I'm, I'm manually rotating and moving different elms around because I don't like... Once again, I'm taking more time with my UV layout, so things are easier in Substance Painter to work with. I'm uh, going to delete these segments because I can't figure out why these normals are faceted. I don't understand it. Uh, and then when I extrude it up, it becomes segmented as well, which is a pain in the butt. And I noticed that my axis is all wrong as well. So a whole bunch of different issues seem to pop up out of nowhere when I just try to subdivide this, this the shaft of this thing in half so that I have uh, it split up in the UV space and I have more space to work with. Finally, at some point, I'm like, duh, uh, the normals are locked. I need to unlock them after I've been trying to bring this thing into Substance Painter. Uh, and I use the, the same material that he uses. He has the... Uh, he's using the, the basic materials ba pretty much for all this kind of, kind of work, um, whereas I have access to, you know, the substance source because of my subscription, and I have, you know, over 500 entries that I can download at any time because I've been buying this months for months now, lots of months. If you do the money, if you do the calculation about how many assets you get uh, and how many assets I've already bought. Also trying to grunge it up a little bit. He kind of used a light dust pattern. I'm also playing with how it's oriented, the wood grain, and I never quite get a pattern I'm I'm enjoying. So I, I, I just kind of leave it at that point. And I actually let the normals double up on the ring parts of this. You'll notice that I got kind of twice as much um, crisscrossing action on that wood. And I just feel like that makes sense with with a ring like that, maybe how you bend the wood to make it make it actually fuse together or, or create something like that. So having it a little bit more normal, a little bit more textured makes sense to me. Go ahead and export all that stuff out. Uh, bring it in, of course, test it out and uh, apply my materials, make a prefab, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for that object. Now we need the knife small for the next one, so I reduce the size of that thing down. Once again, always using a previous object to get the scale right. I also rotate that object and uh, place it so that if you were to pick it up using a controller, that it would naturally fall down the z-axis of the controller you were working with, the forward axis. So that's why the knife is situated that way, as opposed to being rotated 90 degrees on its side. Because yes, it's a tool that's going to be put on the on surfaces, so it, if I, for layout purposes, it might be easier to do that. But if I want to use this tool in the future, it's better to not have to add a 90 degree offset if I pick up an object. Uh, it just makes things easier. And I'm going to admit right now, this is a case where I should not have been messing with the asset. I should have just given up on it and remodeled the entire thing out. There's so much right with this model, but at the same time, there's so much wrong with it. The proportions just seem off to me, the underlying geometry seems off, and here I am, rather than just giving up and starting fresh, I'm struggling with this student's model to try to bring it up to spec. Uh, changing where the bevels are, changing where the cuts are, uh, adding more cuts, taking away cuts, going back and forth, adding some girth to that, that handle as well in some parts and taking it away. and. Yeah, I never quite get happy with it, and instead what I end up with is a model that I'm just slightly frustrated with and just kind of give up on and just say, you know, it's good enough. I do add some roundness to the edge of that blade, and at one point I think, okay, maybe we'll make a high quality version of this with like the, the serrations and stuff, uh, serrated edge and everything. But then I realized how they modeled it, and they made it infinitely thin on the front part of it, so none of my cuts are going across the object. I do add a seam all the way down the center of this object though, because that way when I use my UVs, I can actually unfold this thing like a butterfly almost. Kind of like a butterfly cut if you're making chicken. Uh, and it just kind of comes apart naturally, very nicely. And then of course I add some additional cuts just to try to make things fan out a little bit easier. Not perfect, but it's pretty good. It's better than it was. And uh, now we come in here and that blade was, I don't think you saw what the blade looked like, but it's just completely flat with no life to it whatsoever. 
So I add two different materials. I add an iron rough to the underside. And now I'm playing around with how I'm going to paint the serrate, serrated edges. And there's a grinded one that has nice edges. It's not perfect. It's kind of, it's really not perfect. I probably should have used something else, but it works out fine. And then I remember, hey, doesn't Substance Painter have uh, what we call in ZBrush, Lazy Mouse, but here it's called Distance. Um, so I use that to kind of draw and paint on that, 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 uh, that uh, serrated edge right there. And now I'm trying to figure out what the handle is going to be made out of, and I end up using two different kinds of wood. I search through and I don't find anything that really works for me in this case. So I try using the wedge wood, but the pattern is just not right at all for what this is. It's, it's too small and scaling it up doesn't increase the resolution of the pattern. It just makes it look blurry. So instead I use a different kind of wood with a better pattern at smaller ranges. And then I'm going to add the rough uh, wood texture to it wherever the hand actually grabs the surface of it. So the bottom side and the top side where it actually really comes into contact with your hand and where you're going to be holding it is where things work out. Now I screw something up at this point. I don't know exactly what it is, but I, I forget to add my iron to it. Here I'm playing around with adding, um, you know, something to hold the entire knife together. I put one at the bottom and one at the top. I have no idea how to make knives. So maybe you have two in the center instead, but at least my cutlery at home tends to have one at one side and one at the other. Although really the one at the other side is a hole typically to, so you can put some twine or something through it to hold it someplace. Now we bring this knife in and we're going to have big problems. I want to tell you right now, this is, this is a problem that was created by my student, but also created by me. The problem is, I don't like the naming convention my students were using. They were not following the naming convention that I was using. Uh, like I named this knife medium because knife is the keyword of the object and the size is secondary to the knife. Therefore, knife should come first when you're labeling this object. Uh, they labeled it medium knife. I get confused and because I had imported his textures in beforehand as a package, but because like I mentioned before, things get perverted because he didn't have a folder separate from mine. When I deleted it, I didn't delete everything. I missed some stuff. So what I end up doing is, uh, well, you'll see it soon when the knife doesn't look right. But what I'm doing now is I'm adding that crate and I'm trying to create empty crates on one side and I need to create crates full of, of, of uh, food on the opposite side. So here we're going to load the crate in. And unfortunately, this is my LT. So I don't have any of the dynamic simulation stuff at all. Um, so I have to do this all by hand, which sucks. Uh, but I do it kind of in a way that makes sense. I make one layer, I duplicate it. And then I take it, I rotate it 90 degrees to make another layer. And then I flip it upside down and then rotate it 90 degrees and then do it again. And now I have several layers that look somewhat, you know, organic looking. Then we go ahead and export the entire thing out. And uh, pretty much what I do is the potatoes are a separate asset. And I just create a new prefab where the potatoes are the child of the crate of potatoes. And I bring that into the other scene and put them on the other side. So you can see we're going to have some crates of potatoes. So they've gone through all those crates already is the idea. They've gone through tons of food. And this is what's remaining at this point, which kind of makes sense if they're if this is a scene where they've already prepped the soup. Now I'm looking at my knife and I'm like, what the heck is wrong with this? Notice the name knife medium, right? Well, every time I bring my new textures over, what you're going to notice is that I'm actually uh, putting it in medium knife folder, which is not the folder at all that I'm supposed to be using. So there I'm in knife medium and I'm going to end up right clicking and pasting these things into medium knife. So here, everything in Substance Painter looks right. I'm like, why is this not updating? What the heck is going on? And that's because my materials are from the wrong folder. So even though I'm constantly copying and pasting these things over to make things look right, it's never going to look right because it's the wrong texture that's associated with the material. So finally, at some point, it dawns on me that uh, this is my issue. And I, I fix it, you know, and all the fixes is basically deleting the other folder and uh, reassociating the materials. And then everything works just fine after that. And uh, yeah, I can call it a day on that stupid knife. Now I do go next door, and this is something I'll give Blender since it's free. Uh, I asked my student to try to do a physics simulation of dropping the potatoes in there to make potatoes of different uh, quantities. But the physics simulation never quite worked, so hopefully he gets that figured out. Here's another issue where the student uh, did a mirror, uh, apparently, and that's why you have the edge in the seam uh, in the center. However, when they did the mirror, it also created an extrusion edge in there, which screwed everything up, so I had to delete all that crap. 
And then I had to go in there and I bevel the edges because once again, adding a bevel here and there can really just make your model shine. Um, go through uh, to the legs, unwrap them, surface as well. I go ahead and reduce the size of the underside of the surface because you're never gonna see that pretty much. So there's no reason to be wasting so much UV space on that particular element. So I turn off the pre-scaling thing and everything works pretty well at that point. I go in there and I manually start moving things around, trying to get things a little bit, if you have the padding, why not add it? That way when your mitmaps get created, things aren't going to be quite so blurry and blended together. So I do that manually. Once again, stupid normals being locked. I unlock them, bring them back over. And then uh, we go ahead with the cedar white wood, uh, but I need to tone down that uh, a lot. I also create two different layers, one at 90 degrees, one at zero degrees. And I'm going to use that on the legs because the top part is the uh, zero degree one. This way the wood will actually follow the proper seams or the orientation, I should say, of how you'd expect things to be created. So there we go, our orientation's fixed. Now I'm playing around with the side elements and I didn't, I, I noticed I've got some UV problems. So I, that's probably stemming from these little guys right there. So I break them off and I unwrap it again. I also break those parts off so that they're flatter as well. Um, once again, this way that I won't have any kind of weird warping or distortion. And with wood, with the grain moving across it, you're gonna notice that distortion immediately. And you'll, if you take a look, that all the distortion's gone. It looks just perfectly fine. Now we're dirtying it up. I'm adding a, a wood rough on top of it. And then another wood on top of that as well. And once again, it's more, it's, it's really about less than more in this case, using multiple layers to try to add a little bit of fatigue with each subsequent layer. Now we're adding in some uh, nail holes in, inside this thing, nails. Um, really no need to do that. I was contemplating adding something on the bottom, but I just decided not to. Now I'm playing around with the tools. I'm trying to see if I can do any kinds of stains on the surface. But quite frankly, none of the, because it's just a flat surface, all the tools look too artificial. They've got nothing going in them that makes it look interesting. So I'm just going to go in there with a brush with a different alpha and just manually paint stuff on there. Just so there's some variation where food is splattered and stained things over, you know, probably decades of use. Now we export everything out, bring it off to Unity as usual. And now I finally have a nice little table that I can work with. The problem is the table is actually a little bit too small. I kind of look at it compared to the other tables and I realize I need to scale it up. So I go back into Maya, increase that scale once again, trying to keep everything at a scale of 111 uh, inside of Unity so I'm not messing around with things. Now things have been exported, things are also rescaled. Uh, I can bring that asset back in and things should be just fine. There's my table. Once again, I have to reassociate the materials. Uh, it turns out that I didn't name the thing right, or that is to say the student didn't name it right. So when I brought it over, it wasn't named right either. And their material was named crap too. So I had to go ahead and uh, rename the material as well inside of Maya. And there we go. Now we've got a nice little place. We go into our asset list and I add the small table. I make note of who did what. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Pretty much all the work that's been done. And I'll see you all next time.